contract holdouts aren't exactly the most uncommon thing in today's NFL. Now more than ever, when a player knows his worth and wants a little more money, they'll opt to not play until they can reach a new agreement with their team. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't always work out how one would hope. You can file many NFL contract holdouts under it seemed like a good idea at the time. Sure, some holdouts end up as a win-win. A player gets what he thinks is fair value, and the team doesn't have to trade him. Everybody's happy. But many holdouts have ended miserably for the player, and in many cases, the team as well. It's safe to say that if these 10 NFL players had a time machine, they'd go back in time and maybe think twice about their well-documented holdouts. Jamarcus Russell. The Oakland Raiders drafted the LSU quarterback with the first overall pick in 2007. Russell was immediately viewed as the franchise savior in Oakland, but his NFL career was a mess from day one. Russell and the Raiders couldn't agree to terms on his rookie contract, and he engaged in a holdout that wasn't resolved until week two. So that of course affected his development and preparation for the NFL level. Finally, the two sides agreed to a massive six-year deal worth $68 million. Quite a lot of money for a guy who had yet to play an NFL snap. Head coach Lane Kiffin mostly used Josh McCowan and Dante Culpepper as his starters in 07. Russell made four appearances and only had one start. And as everybody knows, Russell came nowhere close to reaching expectations. He lasted just three years at the Raiders, going 7-18 as the starter with 18 touchdowns against 23 picks. You can't help but wonder what could have been if Russell didn't hold out. What if he just signed the contract immediately? Perhaps he would have been more NFL ready and maybe his development would have gone a lot smoother. Needless to say, both Russell and the Raiders lost out big time as a result of this entire ordeal. Dwayne Thomas. This was a peculiar contract holdout to say the very least, and we haven't seen one like it a half century later. Thomas, a standout running back from West Texas State, was drafted 23rd overall by the Dallas Cowboys in 1970. He became a valuable part of their offense, hitting over 100 rushing yards in the divisional round and conference championship victories. The Cowboys reached Super Bowl V, where they lost to the Baltimore Colts. Thomas wanted his contract to be reworked, but team president Tex Schramm wouldn't budge. Thomas was traded to the New England Patriots in the offseason, only to clash with their head coach, John Mazur, so Commissioner Pete Rizal vetoed the trade, which sent Thomas back to Dallas. So Thomas reluctantly showed up to play the 1971 season in Dallas, but he opted to cease communication with his teammates and coaches. He led the NFL in rushing touchdowns that year with 11, and then he helped Dallas to a Super Bowl VI victory over the Miami Dolphins. Despite the championship glory, Thomas's relationship with the Cowboys was never repaired. So they reluctantly dealt the rising star to the San Diego Chargers. But it was more of the same for Thomas, who was uncooperative with his new team. The Chargers traded Thomas to Washington in 1973 before he even played a single snap with the team. In two seasons there, Thomas recorded only 442 total rushing yards and five touchdowns. And then he was out of the NFL for good. Thomas looked destined for a long and successful career, one that could have put him in the Hall of Fame. Winning a Super Bowl ring was nice and all, but the never-ending discontent with his contract status prevented him from becoming an all-time great. Who knows what he could have accomplished if he just stuck around in Dallas with Tom Landry and Roger Staubach. Terrell Owens Owens, first and only full season with the Philadelphia Eagles, was almost flawless. He and Donovan McNabb formed an explosive combo as T.O. racked up 1,200 yards on 77 catches for 14 touchdowns. Philly, of course, went all the way to Super Bowl 39 where they narrowly fell to the Patriots. In the offseason, Owens lobbied for a new contract. He was in the midst of a seven-year pact worth $49 million. Although he reported to training camp, Owens made it clear how angry he was about his contract situation. He kept publicly throwing teammate Donovan McNabb under the bus and got into a physical altercation with Hugh Douglas. 
Owens' behavior became too much for the Eagles, who suspended him for the remainder of the season. He was released in the 2006 offseason and signed with the rival Dallas Cowboys. Now, Owens enjoyed three brilliant seasons with Tony Romo in Dallas as he crossed 1,000 yards every year there. But the Eagles were simply the better team without Owens. Winning the NFC East in 2006 and even reaching the 2008 NFC Championship game, Owens' tenure in Big D only amounted to one playoff win. Had he stayed with McNabb? Who knows? Maybe T.O. would have won that elusive Super Bowl ring. <laughs> Just saying. Maurice Jones Drew. MJD was coming off a career year in 2011 with the Jacksonville Jaguars. He rushed for a league leading 1,606 yards and eight touchdowns, earning Pro Bowl and first team All Pro honors. Understandably, Jones Drew wanted to get paid what he was worth. So he took part in what turned out to be a 38 day holdout, looking for a raise with just two years remaining on the bargain five year, $31 million contract he signed in 2009. But the Jaguars refused to give him a new contract, and Jones Drew finally gave in and showed up just before the start of the 2012 regular season. Unfortunately, MJD lasted just six games. He suffered a foot injury in week six against the Raiders, and it turned out to be season ending. Even before the injury, he didn't look like his Pro Bowl self, averaging only 69 rushing yards a game, a far cry from the 100.4 he averaged in 2011. Jones Drew lasted one more season in Duval County, but he failed to regain his top four. He then played one more season with the Raiders in 2014. So Jones Drew never got the raise he sought, and he was never a pro bowler again after returning from the holdout. Yeah, this one didn't work out in the end. Joey Galloway. In 1998, the Star Seattle Seahawks wideout hit the 1,000 yard mark for the third time in four years. Galloway also racked up 10 touchdown receptions, just shy of the career high 12 he had in 1997. So it was easy to understand why he wanted a new contract from the Seahawks. He held out and wound up missing half the season. When he returned, Galloway simply wasn't his usual self. He only had 22 catches for 335 yards and just one touchdown. Seattle refused to give him a new deal, and Callaway was traded to the Dallas Cowboys in the ensuing offseason. He then agreed to a seven-year deal worth $42 million. But Callaway never justified that hefty contract. He only topped 700 yards once and had just 12 total touchdowns and four seasons with Dallas. Galloway joined a team that was in decline without Michael Irvin. And it didn't help that Troy Aikman had to retire after the 2000 season because of concussion problems. Galloway was the perfect fit in Mike Holmgren's offense. And Seattle slowly but surely began to rise as a Super Bowl contender in the 2000s with Matt Hasselbeck and Sean Alexander. If only Galloway stayed there, waited for his new deal, and then who knows what could have happened from there. Larry Johnson. In 2006, Johnson rushed for a career high 1,789 yards and he racked up 17 touchdowns. That was only three shy of his personal best from the year prior. Before the 2007 season, Johnson engaged in a holdout that wound up lasting a month. He returned in August and agreed to a new deal worth $43.2 million over five years. But Johnson's career plummeted from there. The troubled running back appeared in eight games before suffering a season-ending foot injury. But even before he got hurt, Johnson was averaging a mere 3.5 yards per carry and only 69.9 rushing yards per contest. Johnson improved slightly in 2008, but had off-the-field legal problems and missed four games because of suspension. He got off to a miserable start in 2009, got suspended by the team again, and was waived mid-season. The Cincinnati Bengals picked up Johnson, who appeared in seven games. OJ had short and unproductive stints with Washington and the Miami Dolphins in 2010 and 2011, respectively. He was then out of the NFL soon after. His attitude, ego, and well-documented off-the-field issues were the key factors in Johnson's downfall. Kelly Stauffer. Okay, this was a weird one. The St. Louis Cardinals drafted the promising Colorado State quarterback with the number six selection in 1987, but Stauffer played exactly zero offensive snaps for them. The reason? The two sides couldn't reach an agreement on his rookie contract. So Stauffer sat out the entire 1987 campaign and the Cardinals wound up trading him to the Seahawks in the ensuing offseason. Stauffer spent four seasons with Seattle, losing 11 of 16 starts while tossing just seven touchdowns against 19 picks. Stauffer never played in the NFL again after the 1992 season. I mean, seeing how much he 
flopped in Seattle, it's safe to say he probably should have just stayed in St. Louis, right? The tenure there couldn't have gone that much worse. Melvin Gordon III Coming off his second career Pro Bowl selection, Gordon sought a considerable raise from the Los Angeles Chargers heading into 2019. They reportedly offered a deal that would have paid him around $10 million annually, but Gordon wanted even more. The Chargers wouldn't move from their offer, and Gordon responded by sitting out the first four games. He finally returned in Week 5, but Gordon struggled while Austin Eckler emerged as the new lead back in LA. Gordon averaged just 3.8 yards per carry and 51 rushing yards per game in 12 contests with the Chargers, who had the easy decision to let him walk. In 2020 free agency, Gordon settled on a two-year, $16 million pack with the Denver Broncos. Not a terrible payday by any means, but obviously not the $10 million per year payday he could have had. Can you imagine Gordon in that offense with Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, and Mike Williams? The guy misread his own market, to say the very least. Le'Veon Bell. Oh, yikes. Le'Veon Bell went from the league's most explosive do-it-all running back on a Super Bowl contender to, well, neither of those. After the 2017 season, the Steelers placed the franchise tag on Bell. Their final offer to him was a mammoth five-year pact worth $70 million, but he rejected it. The three-time Pro Bowler then engaged in a holdout and decided to sit out the entire 2018 season. The Steelers' offense clearly missed Bell in what turned out to be a drama-filled and extremely disappointing 2018 season. On the bright side for Bell, he got a shiny four-year $52.5 million deal from the New York Jets in free agency the following offseason. But Bill's tenure with the Jets was nothing short of a disaster. He lasted one full season and then was released early in the 2020 campaign. He finished out the season with the Kansas City Chiefs, who went all the way to the Super Bowl. Of course, they got blown out by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, so Bell didn't get a ring to complete his redemption story. And so, here's how it all played out. Bell lost out on a $70 million deal, several more prime years in Pittsburgh's offense, and multiple opportunities at a championship. From a long-term standpoint, the Steelers are probably glad he didn't take that contract after all. It's a different story for Bell, though. What a giant, colossal mistake he made. Tony Mandarich Sports Illustrated memorably hyped Mandarich as the best offensive line prospect ever. The Michigan State standout and two-time Big Ten Offensive Lineman of the Year was drafted second overall by the Green Bay Packers in 1989. The first overall pick, Troy Aikman. The next three picks after Mandarich, Barry Sanders, Derek Thomas, and Deion Sanders. In that order. All of those guys are in the Hall of Fame, except for Mandarich. Mandarich engaged in a lengthy holdout with the Packers and didn't end up signing his rookie deal until just days before the Week 1 opener. Clearly, all that time away from the field hampered his preparation and readiness for the NFL. Why do I say this? Well, because he was a flat-out bust who never came close to performing like the generational talent he was hyped to be. He lasted just three seasons in Green Bay. Mandarich also played three seasons for the Indianapolis Colts from 1996 to 98, but the change of scenery didn't change much. You can only wonder if Mandarich would have panned out had he never engaged in a lengthy holdout in the first place. But what other NFL contract holdouts backfired big time? Join us in the comment section below. If you like this video and learned a thing or two, clicking the like button helps out a ton. And hey, we appreciate it. If this is your first time coming around to TPS though, subscribing is a great idea because we put out videos like this every single day. But as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.